All right. And it's actually a, uh, oh, that's not the right display. Uh, if anybody was wondering what my Google Drive looked like for Algebra 1, there it is. All those uh, burning questions finally being answered. All right. So x equals tangent of y. This is actually a good tie. Well, I've collected these problems for reasons. Um, it's a very good tie into what we're going to be covering. So let's just investigate uh, the derivative of this using implicit differentiation. And then before too long, you'll see another way in which you can figure out the derivative. So here I, I need to find dy dx. All right. So. I'm going to take the derivative of this, like I said, implicitly. The left-hand side just becomes a 1. The right-hand side becomes what? What's the derivative of tangent? Secant squared y, and then we multiply by dy dx. All right. So then I can solve for dy dx by dividing out the secant squared. So I get dy dx is equal to 1 over secant squared y. But 1 over secant squared y is the same as saying what? Just cosine squared y. All right. So we have successfully found a derivative, but it kind of begs the question of, and, uh, you know, begs the question for me, maybe, maybe not so much on your end yet, but what if I needed the derivative in terms of x, how would I handle something like that? Well, that, that would be somewhat challenging, at least in this current composition, but if you go back to the original equation and just kind of pull that off on the side, Tangent of y, I'm just equals x. I'm going to write that x over 1. All right. So you look at that and you say, okay, well, cool. It's a trig ratio. All right. But it's more to it than that because it, it connects everything. <clears throat> so going back to Algebra 1 when you first learned about SOHCAHTOA, tend to move away from this definition, but it's always there. It's just a few things like find identity relationships and solve trig equations, things like that. Very rarely do we go back to the SOCA and TOA part of this story. All right, but anyway, whenever you're finding the trig function of a particular argument, that argument represents an angle. In a, in a triangle, in a reference triangle. So I'm going to draw an arbitrary reference triangle. I can orient it any way I want because this is variable based. So, yeah, y can be a negative quantity, x can be a negative quantity, but I have no reason to make that assumption. All right. I do know that y represents some unknown angle. All right. So a reference angle within my reference triangle. That ratio of x over 1 would be the opposite side and the adjacent side of that corresponding triangle. All right, so the opposite side would be here, and that would be x. The adjacent side would be here, and that would be 1. All right. What would the missing side of my triangle be? Radical x squared plus 1. Okay, so what I need from this, because I, I just drew that triangle for, seemingly just for fun, but if you go back to the derivative, it says cosine squared of y, which I can think of as, I hate when it does that. That one was fine. Let me just get another little guy. All right, I can think of that as cosine of y squared. Now the cosine ratio is adjacent over hypotenuse. So 
So from that triangle, which represents all the trig ratios associated with the angle Y, I would need the adjacent side and the hypotenuse. 1 over the square root of x squared plus 1. as a quantity squared. And so we would end up with 1 over x squared plus 1. So your derivative, believe it or not, can be written in two forms. One form would be cosine squared y. The other would be 1 over x squared plus 1. They're both equivalent. All right, it's surprising. You wouldn't necessarily think that a trig function could correspond to an algebraic function, but they can and they do. And you'll see moving forward that we're going to rely on that information because if you can transform from a algebraic function to a trig function, then you can just take the derivative of the trig function and then convert it back to an algebraic form. So if you have some really messy algebraic expression, something that will involve like really nasty product quotient chain rule stuff, then maybe converting it over into a trig form makes it something simple like, all right, the derivative of tangent is secant squared, and then you can convert that back over to the algebraic form, all right? So it's a, it's a nifty substitution, all right? Now, this is kind of like, uh, well, I'm stealing my own thunder for the, the lesson related to inverse trig functions, but if I take x equals the, uh, equals tangent of y, and I wanted to solve it for y in terms of x. All right, so this is implicitly defined. Well, actually, it's, it's, it's explicit. It's just explicit with x being our dependent variable. We want it to be explicit with y being the dependent variable. So it's, it's not what we want. It's not technically implicit, but we use implicit techniques. All right, if I wanted to solve this for y, I would have to take the inverse tangent of both sides. In which case, I'd be looking at y equals the inverse tangent of x. All right, x equals tangent of y, y equals inverse tangent of x, they mean the same thing. All right, what we just discovered is that the derivative of x equals tangent of y Yes, it could be thought of as cosine squared y, but it could also be thought of as 1 over x squared plus 1. If y equals the inverse tangent of x is the same as that, then it would have the same derivative. All right. So we just learned that the derivative of the inverse tangent of x is equal to 1 over x squared plus 1. So it was discovery in this problem, but it, it'll be a rule moving forward. Okay. And we'll, we'll do more with that later. I'm not going to leave it up to a single problem in a homework assignment to teach you a concept. You know, there's an entire lesson based off of this. Um, I have a talk. Like, it's not in the picture. But um, I'm still trying to do why. If, if there's no, like, function in a function, like, why are you multiplying it by dy or dx in the second step? Because this y is assumed to be a function of some other variable. We just don't know what the function is. So we always have to multiply by the derivative of whatever the y is. Whenever we're, to, in general, for implicit differentiation, whenever we take the derivative of a y term, we're always multiplying by dy dx. But the rationale behind it is because y and x, actually any function, could be in terms of another function. All right, so I can do something, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it relatively simple. Let's say you have x, y equals 1. If I were to take the derivative of this implicitly, it would be first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. The derivative of the first would be a dx dx. And then 0. All right, what implicit differentiation allows us for is the possibility <coughs> that maybe x is a function of t where it's defined as, let's say, VO cosine theta times time. You know, so a parametric form. And Y 
would be V O sine theta T minus, and this is just for example, because it could really be defined as anything. Uh, I'll just write it as 16 T squared, just to keep it simple. But it's allowing for X and Y to be different functions. And if they are different functions, then we can't just say Y becomes a one, because Y could become a whole lot more than one when you take its derivative. So what we would just say is that I would be taking the derivative of whatever this function is in terms of x, since I don't know what the function is, I can't just simply state what the derivative would be. All right. In the case of dx dx, it turns out it doesn't matter because I'd be dividing a quantity by itself. It cancels to one no matter what. All right. But this technique, implicit differentiation, allows for the fact that y and x can themselves be other functions. And we don't want to always treat them like constants. Sometimes we can, but not always. Right, because the derivative of y would be 1, but then because you're taking the derivative of a y term, it gets multiplied by dy dx. Let's say the inner function is like secant squared of 2y. Would you then be times uh, 2 dy dx? Exactly, okay. exactly. All right, so let me see if there was another triggy looking one. What's this? What's this? What's this? No, that wasn't assigned. 33? Oh, yeah. There we go. Thank you. All right, so 2xy plus pi times the sine of y E equals 2 pi and we need to find the tangent and normal lines at the coordinate that's given in this case 1 comma pi over 2 all right so a little more work here in terms of the differentiation we've got a little product rule going on for the first piece I'm gonna treat this as 2x multiplied by y so I have my first function as 2x and my second as y. So first times the derivative of the second, dy dx, plus the second, which is the y, times the derivative of the first, which is just a 2. constant multiple of pi, and then the derivative of sine of y would be what? Cosine y times dy dx. On the right-hand side, 2 pi is constant. Derivative of a constant is always equal to 0. All right. So what we want to do now is it will really just make a choice because again you can clean it up solve for dy dx then substitute in your information or substitute it in early on see if that cleans things up even nicer and then go forward from there like for example in this case if i were to plug it in now i have a y value of pi over two that's going in so we have an x and a y value, but it's really the, the y value that's important here because I have a cosine of y. Cosine of pi over 2 is equal to what? Yeah. Zero. All right. So this part, that, that part in purple, is irrelevant because it's going to cancel anyway. 
right? So all this would go away. So two times one, so two dy dx, plus then two times pi over two, which is gonna be pi, would be equal to zero. The equation that we have to solve just got a whole lot nicer just by doing the substitution early on rather than later on. After we've taken the derivative, we can do it whenever we want. All right, so subtract, divide. Uh, dy dx would be negative pi over two. All right, so this represents the slope of the tangent at that particular point. I need the equation of the tangent line. I think it was the equation of it. Yeah. So equation of the tangent, y equals m times x minus x sub 1 plus y sub 1. <coughs> And then we also need the equation of the normal line, which is the same idea as the tangent line, except we do what to the slope? Reciprocal. Negative reciprocal. So it becomes 2 over pi. Everything else remains the same. Good question. Also, it's, it's one of those, uh, I don't know, when you think tangent line, slope at a point, it, it almost always screams, oh, this is a calculator problem, but you see the answers are in terms of pi, it's not easily determined using a calculator, so this is one of those crossover questions that seems like it, it would be a calculator question, but you do have to do a little bit by hand, I think. Uh, what else? From this assignment. Page 155 and 170, right? 170, we had 19 and 30 uh, and 43. Be uh, utterly shocked if you're able to handle anything on page 170 because I hadn't taught you how to do it yet. So, good shocked. You like you you investigated it on your own, either you looked it up or you intuited the solution, in which case you did two really awesome things. That being said, does anybody have a question on one of those problems? Number forty three, Number 43, sure. All right, so it says use the technique of logarithmic differentiation. You're like, well, what? Where did that come from? The funny thing about a textbook, it doesn't just have problems. But aside from that, uh, a quick search on what logarithmic differentiation shows you that it's probably uh, conceptually one of the easier things in the unit because all it is is a, a first step. Once you apply the first step, everything else after that is the same as it's always been. All right, so it's called logarithmic differentiation. My first step most likely will involve a logarithm. Fun fact. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the natural log of both sides of the equation. Natural log because those are easy to differentiate. All right, we, we have simple rules for natural logs, more complicated rules for other types of logs. All right, so that's log differentiation. Well, the log part of it anyway. After that, it's now find the derivative of this, this new equation. So, but before we do that, let's kind of justify the whole point behind taking the log of both sides. All right. So natural log of y on the left-hand side, uh, that is what it is. But on the right-hand side, I have an exponent of x. All right. We have product 
and quotient rules for derivatives, yeah, but before that you had product and quotient rules and power rules for logs, all right? So don't lose sight of those things because the power rule for logarithms tells us that an exponent becomes a coefficient if it's the exponent of the item that's contained within the natural log. So now if it's the entire natural log being raised to a power, that's, that's not the same thing. It's only the argument within the natural log that's being raised to a power. So this is the same as saying x times ln of sine of x. All right, I'm not putting the absolute values around the sine of x because I'm just keeping it in mind that the natural log would only apply to non-negative values. If at any point we run into, you know, if we needed to solve this, you know, plug in a value of x or actually solve for a value of x, I would take note of what, what the quality was of that x value and just making sure that it doesn't cause a natural log to become uh, of a negative number or a zero. All right, so now we differentiate. So the derivative of ln of y would become what? One over y dy dx. On the right-hand side, well, it's made up exclusively in terms of x value, so I don't have to worry about implicit stuff on the right hand side. And in fact, in its original form, it didn't seem like I would have to worry about implicit differentiation. But the minute we took the log of both sides, then it, become an, it became a, um, or an implicitly defined function. So first, x times the derivative of the second. What is the derivative of the natural log of the sine of x? One over sine x times cosine x, okay, and that simplifies to what? We have a cosine of x over a sine of x, cotangent of x, and then put it together, you get your x cotangent of x. All right, plus my second function, ln of sine of x, times the derivative of the first. But we're actually a half a step away from having the right answer. All right, I need dy dx, not 1 over y dy dx. So let me multiply everything by a y. If I can control the situation, so if I have any control over it, I don't want to leave it in terms of y. Although we've worked with plenty of problems where you have x and y in a derivative, plenty meaningless for. But still, so it, it's not unprecedented. You can have a y in an answer. But if you know what y happens to be equal to, you have a very good reason why you could actually swap it out. Do we happen to know what y is equal to? Sine of x to the x. Sine of x to the x. That was a given piece of information. That's where the journey began. So that expression represents the derivative of the sine of x to the x power. So, when you're dealing with anything of the form of x to the x, so variable base and variable the exponent, you, you, you run into a problem because it's not power rule, because it's not a power function. It's not an exponential function. It's some sort of hybrid. It's a mixture of the two. The goal would be to get rid of the thing that's causing the problem, which would be the variable exponent. The way to handle that would be to apply a natural law. But the good news about this is, if you accidentally use log differentiation in a situation where you're like, well, 
I don't know if I'm supposed to use law of differentiation here. I'm worried that I'm, I'm picking the wrong circumstance and by doing so, I'm gonna waste my time. You're never gonna be wasting your time. All right, let's say you have something like y equals e to the x. All right, we already know the derivative of this, right? So let me take the natural log of both sides. Then take the derivative. Now that ln of e to the x is the same as what? x, right? And the derivative of x is 1. So dy dx would be equal to y, but they told us in the beginning that y was e to the x. All right. So you can use log differentiation in more ways than you might think. Uh, and to the best of my knowledge, I haven't explored every function that exists because that's not possible. But I think I can confidently say that it works all the time. Right? So why would you choose to use log differentiation? Well. You take a chain rule problem that's pretty complicated with a power. Any power can become a coefficient when it comes to a, to a natural log. If you have a product, any product becomes a sum. Any quotient becomes subtraction. Okay, so we have complicated situations when we're dealing with products and quotients because if you have a product, you have to use a product rule. If you have the quotient, you can use the quotient, you have to use the quotient rule. But if I'm telling you that there's a technique out there that allows you to take a product and transform it into a sum, now I don't have to worry about the product rule anymore. That's incredible. All right, so just a, another quick one, because I'm, I'm on fire here, like really pumped up about this topic. Let's say you have y equals I'll, I'll just keep it simple, x sine x. All right, so definitely a product rule situation, right? You have x as its own function multiplied by a new function sine of x, all right? If I, if I use the product rule, I get the right answer. But if I use log differentiation, natural log of y, and then the natural log of the whole right-hand side. <coughs> Now, the left-hand side, I mean, it's not as simple as just dy dx. It's 1 over y dy dx. But the right-hand side, before you take the derivative, the log of a product is equal to the sum of the log. So ln of x plus ln of sine of x. So I would take the derivative of this instead. Derivative of ln of x is 1 over x. Derivative of the natural log of sine x is cotangent x. We know that because that's something we just did. All right. So my derivative would be 1 over x plus cotangent of x multiplied by the original y. The original y was x sine x. All right. And if you clean this up, simplify it, distribute things out, reorganize, it'll end up giving you equivalence to x cosine x plus sine x. But this gets the job done too, and you don't have to worry about product rule. All right.